I am General of the Army Ulysses S. Grant, and tonight I should like to reflect with you in the second part of a series of my reflections on my relationship with General John Alexander McClernand, Volunteer General. It was a difficult one, and uh, I should like to think out loud about, about it with you and give you my insights. Uh, into what was going on. And I pick up after the Battle of Shiloh. The period of inactivity for the month after Shiloh and uh, going into May and then the period of a month or so, the glacial march on Corinth, uh, chagrined General McClernand, and he grew uh, very irritable about being subordinate, no action, uh, subordinate to me with no action. So he, uh, on May 31st, he wrote his friend, President Lincoln, a letter and uh, said that he would like to have an independent command. Now, in that in letter, he said that if you will give me an independent command in an active and contested field, I will try and reward your confidence with success. And President Lincoln took that to heart. Nothing was going well for the federal war effort. But I also want to add to you what Charles A. Dana said to Secretary of War Stanton about Congressman and now General McClernand. He wrote Secretary Stanton um, that John McClernand was a man of a good deal of a certain kind of talent, not of a high order but not one of intellectual accomplishments. His education was that, that a man gets uh, in Congress for five or six years. In short, McClernand was merely a smart man, quick, very active-minded, but his judgment was not solid, and he looked after himself a good deal. He was granted his leave to go back to Springfield, Illinois, and he visited with Governor Yates, but he left almost immediately to go to Washington, and he spent the month of August and into September with President Lincoln. And in, indeed, he went to the battlefield of Antietam to visit with uh, President Lincoln as he visited with George McClellan, and that's why there are some photographs of General McClellan with General McClernand and the President, and General McClernand with the President, and Alan Pinkerton, and several others. General McClernand was using that time to try to convince President Lincoln to give him an independent command to go down the Mississippi River. Now, this wasn't a, a new concept or a new idea. In fact, I think it was August 3rd that the cabinet had actually had a discussion on going down the Mississippi River, uh, how to do it, to reopen the river for military use and for civilian commerce and transport. It was an idea that I had had, Halleck had had it. It was not original uh, to General McClernand. And he wanted the president to give him a command to go down the Mississippi River, take Vicksburg, then take Port Hudson south of Vicksburg and on to New Orleans. He, uh, I understand, described the, the Vicksburg campaign that it would, Vicksburg was a minor obstacle, take a couple of weeks, and he'd go on down and take Port Hudson. Well, the president listened to him because the war effort was not going well. And McClernand wanted to recruit his own army in Illinois. So the president agreed to General McClernand being able to recruit his own army from Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa. And he gave him, indeed, it was on October 21st that the president gave him secret orders. The president and Secretary Stanton were both part of this. Secret uh, General-in-Chief Halleck was also uh, involved in this, although Halleck opposed McClernand being given an independent command. 
Gus McClarney was a military general with no military experience. He was one of 187 men appointed to the rank of general who had little or no military experience, 187 men. And the uh, general in chief, now Halleck opposed him being given that. The president told him that, ha that McClernand was his man. He said, I, I'm much better general than Grant and uh, gave him that command. Now there were two addendums to that. First, I should tell you what McClernand was granted. He was told that he could uh, raise 24,000 infantry, 300 cavalry, 1,600 artillerymen in 10 batteries, and his own siege train. And that's what the president told him he could raise. Now, McClernand also had used a, a lever of great weight with the president because enlistments had dropped dramatically by the fall of 62. Casualty numbers had come in and wounded men and bodies had gone home. So the war fervor had dipped substantially. But McClernand was well known in Illinois. The president felt that McClernand could raise an army. Illinois was charged with raising nearly 60,000 men. And indeed, they produced some 44 regiments. McClernand can only be credited with about 15 of those because he, he was in Illinois from about August 31st to December 23rd when he finally left to come back to take his command. Uh, and in that time, there were 44 regiments, but several had come in about the time he got back to Illinois in late August. Uh, some came in shortly after he left. He can be credited with having influenced possibly 15 regiments. But the men were not enlisting, and McClernand gave them an option to go into the, the war with honor because it was dishonorable to be drafted with the new conscription law. So men would rather be known to have enlisted than to be drafted and possibly accused of showing a white feather. McClernand raised these men, and uh, he was sending them back to Cairo, Illinois, to go to Memphis. Well, while he was in Washington, he talked to David Porter. The Porter visited with the president. The president asked him who he thought was the general to lead the expedition. Porter said, Grant. The president said, no, I don't think so. McClernand is the man to do it. And Porter said, I don't know the man. And the president had him go meet him. Porter met with him. And uh, Secretary of the Navy, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Gus Fox, asked him what he thought. He said, I could draw no conclusions about the man. And I'm leaving to go to Cairo to meet with Grant. Well, when he came back to me in uh, October, he told me what was going on or hinted what was going on. And I already knew something was happening because men were coming, regiments were coming to Cairo, Illinois, and sent to Memphis with orders that they're supposed to report to General McClernand. Command at Cairo knew nothing of this, and they would be sent to Memphis. And in the interim, I'm being told there's something afoot I didn't know what it was, but what the actuality was that John McClernand had been given an independent command to take Vicksburg, Mississippi, and I was to be, if indeed at all, a corollary. And uh, this alarmed me greatly. So I contacted General Halleck, and, well, General Halleck prevailed upon the president when he gave McClernand the orders on October 21st to say this, when a sufficient force, not required by the operations of General Grant's command, shall be raised, an expedition may be organized under General McClernand's command against Vicksburg and to clear the Mississippi River and open navigation to New Orleans. General Halleck prevailed upon the President and the Secretary to add this, the expedition would remain subject 
to the designation of the General-in-Chief. So the caveat there, and McClernand apparently either chose not to acknowledge this or completely missed it, not required by operations of General Grant's command, then it may be raised, and the expedition would remain subject to the designation of the General-in-Chief. So Halleck re retained overall say on how the troops would be used. And I was given commands. I was still in command of the expedition to go south into Vicksburg. And the uh, Halleck wrote me, well, first I had telegraphed Halleck and said, is General Sherman reserved or his forces reserved for some special purpose? Am I to stay here in Memphis idle while nothing is happening? And General Halleck had telegraphed me back and said that I was uh, able to fight the enemy where I chose. You may fight the enemy where you please. And uh, Sherman is not reserved. So I began to send Sherman down river on the Arkansas and Louisiana side, the west bank of the river, to establish the forces to have uh, available to march south after we ran the batteries at Vicksburg. And the uh, message I got from Halleck on December the 18th was, it is the wish of the president that General McClernand's Corps shall constitute a part of the river expedition and that he shall have the immediate command under your direction. And that was on December the 18th. And I had asked the general to clarify the limits of my command. And if Sherman was on special assignment, and General Halleck said, you have command of all the troops sent to your department and have permission to fight the enemy where you please. So I have no definite limits to my command and I have command of all the troops in my department. So I, as I said, I busied Sherman with getting down river. I knew pretty much by this time that McClernand, whatever was happening, was going to be in command of it. McClernand outranked Sherman, and I wanted Sherman with those troops that were coming in down river and prepared to march south past Vicksburg before McClernand came back on the scene and would take command. And uh, also, well, I sent him down. As soon as he, well, he gets back to Memphis on December the 28th, I believe it was. Now, what had happened on December the 19th and 20th for us in the campaign was that on the 19th, Nathan Bedford Forrest tore up 30 miles of railroad and telegraph wires in Jackson, Tennessee. And on the 19th, the 20th Earl Van Dorn destroyed all my supplies at Holly Springs, Mississippi. So, and Sherman is defeated at Chickasaw Bayou in his attempt to, to divert attention from uh, me to march into Grenada, Mississippi and take Pemberton, who is in that area. All that, that came to naught because by the, the December the 20th, I've got no supplies left to take the Mississippi campaign down the Mississippi Central Railroad as I had planned. And I have, don't have any way to get supplies and I have no communication. Now, that worked in a sense to my advantage because by this time in late December, mid to late December, McClernand was back in Illinois. He's chafing now to get back to his command. He's raised the troops. He wants to get back and take command and move down and take Vicksburg and uh, apparently get the glory for it. And Secretary of War Stanton was in essence stalling him. And McClernand bombards him with, why am I held here idle? Why do I not have orders? And this is where no communication comes into effect. I ultimately sent an order to, uh, tried to send an order to McClernand 
uh, I got orders from Stanton that he was to join me. And because there was no communications, Forrest had destroyed them. I couldn't get the word to McLernan. So he stayed in Springfield, Illinois. And didn't. And on the 23rd of December, he married his wife's younger sister. Uh, Sarah had died, and he married Minerva Dunlap, about 20 years younger than he was, and uh, brings her back with him, gets to Memphis on, I think, December the 29th. He, he arrived in Memphis. Oh, he had also named his father-in-law, uh, Mr. Dunlap, a colonel on his staff. So he was married to two daughters. Does that, is there some kind of a relationship there, a double son-in-law? At any rate, he married his wife's younger sister. And he brings her back with him despite orders not to bring families. I've even sent Julia and the children back to St. Louis. But when he gets to Memphis on December 29th, he's expecting to find 25 five or 30,000 men, artillery, cavalry, uh, and they're not there. Because as every man got to Memphis, I sent them down river to Sherman, under Sherman's command. So he was, as I understand, beside himself when he found out that I had done that. And he began protesting that there was a West Point conspiracy against him and against volunteer officers, which was not the case, but he was loudly protesting that. And he went down river to uh, meet Sherman and got there at Helena, Arkansas on uh, January the 6th or 7th of 63. Now we're in 63. And he, Sherman had suggested to him that we take the uh, Arkansas Post Fort up the Arkansas River uh, some distance and uh, eliminate a threat to our rear as we went down the river. I thought it was McLaren's idea, and I, I had wired Halleck, it's a goose chase, wild goose chase, it's a waste of time and manpower. I found out later that it was Sherman's idea, and that calmed me down a little bit, and it did some good. Uh, after a two-day, essentially, naval fight, the fort there at Arkansas Post surrendered. They surrendered 5,000 prisoners. Uh, our losses were 1,000, 1,100. So we captured 5,000 prisoners, neutralized the Arkansas River, and eliminated the threat to our rear. So that turned out to be a, a good thing. Now, Sher McClernand, remember, is in command over Sherman. When McClernand had gotten there, when he arrived on January the 3rd, he renamed the troops the Army of the Mississippi. Now, he, he feels this is going to be his independent command, independent of me. I command the Army of the Tennessee. He's even named the unit Army of the Mississippi uh, as something I think of an affront to me. And Sherman didn't like it, but he went along with it. He made Sherman the Corps commander, and uh, Sherman said, well, I'll obey orders. When they got back to uh, Helena from the Arkansas Post, I began to get messages from both uh, Admiral Porter and from Sherman. You've got to come down here and take command yourself because uh, McClernand is not a good leader. He's wreaking havoc. And I knew that uh, I had to get down there to control McClernand. He, put, he was unfit for the command, and I made that clear to General Halleck. But I, I went down and personally uh, took command. And I, I left on the 20, I arrived on the 29th of uh, 1863, and on the 30th, I formally took command. Now, I took command of what McClernand had felt in a very proprietary manner was his army. And I made him a corps commander, 13th Corps. Uh, there were four corps. Uh, Sherman had, I think, the 15th and McPherson the 17th and uh, General Hurlbut was in Memphis with the 16th. But there are three corps there on the west bank of the Mississippi and Arkansas and Louisiana that are going to try to, to take Vicksburg. And McClernand 
is a Corps commander. Now, when he got, when I got down there in uh, late January, General Halleck sent me this telegram. You are hereby authorized to relieve General McClernand from command of the expedition against Vicksburg, giving it to the next in rank or taking it yourself. And that's, that's when I had gone down immediately. I, that was the final hint to me, get down there. So General Halleck has given me permission to relieve McClernand as I saw fit. Also about that time, Secretary of War Stanton sent a telegram via Charles Dana. And uh, Dana didn't have a, a very high opinion of McClernand. But Secretary Stanton, hearing what's been happening and the activities of General McClernand, sent this message to me via Charles A. Dana. General Grant has full and absolute authority to enforce his own command and to remove any person who, by ignorance, in action, or any cause, interferes with or delays his operations. He has the full confidence of the government, is expected to enforce his authority, and will be firmly and heavily supported but he will be responsible for any failure to exert his powers. You may communicate this to him. Now I've got it in writing from the Secretary of War and the General-in-Chief that I may relieve General McClernand if and when I should see fit. Now McClernand is chafing at the, the, the bit and bucking in the saddle and giving me some difficulties uh, and in this time period, we moved from Helena down south into Louisiana. I got some complaints from personnel of the 54th Indiana, and I forwarded those that complaint to General McClernand and asked him to look into the complaints of legitimacy and address those issues. And uh, General McClernand sent me this telegram. The enforcement of your order will be the subversion of my authority at the instance of an inferior who deserves to be arrested for his indirection and spirit of insubordination. As I am invested by order of the Secretary of War, endorsed by the President and by order of the President, with the command of all forces operating on the Mississippi River. I claim that all orders affecting the condition or operation of those forces should pass through these headquarters. If different views are entertained by you, then the question should be immediately referred to Washington and one or other or both of us relieved. One thing is certain, two generals cannot command this army, issuing independent and direct orders to subordinate officers and the public service be promoted. Indeed, I took that to be a challenge. If you don't like what I'm doing, then let's go to the president and see who's going to be in command because two of us cannot command. I kept this in mind. Well, on April 29th, uh, or rather March 29th, I ordered that we move south in preparation to cross the river and uh, take Vicksburg. March the 30th, McClernand gets his men moving uh, in a timely manner and moved down south, uh, and, the, uh, and the movement was on. A uh, great deal of difficulty, heavy rains, miserable weather. The men were having great difficulty finding dry ground to live on, uh, to camp on. Great uh, uh, deal of disease, sickness. Uh, everything was always wet, miserable conditions. But by the 30th, 31st rather, we had started to move. Now, I will not go into running the batteries 
and uh, all of that movement and activity that got us to crossing the river on April 30th. But on April the 30th, uh, Admiral Porter ferried across McPherson's 13th Corps, and by midday, he had gotten 17,000 men across that river. And then uh, more came over in the afternoon, and within a day or two, Sherman brought a division across, or McPherson rather sent a division across. And uh, McClernand was the first to cross. Now, I've been asked if you didn't care for McClernand, why did you choose him to spearhead this? McClernand was the closest. And uh, Sherman was a distance away, and McClernand had more combat experience than McPherson, but essentially, McClernand was the closest. And uh, the 13th Army Corps led the, uh, the attack, moving up to of the Battle of Fort Gibson on May the 1st. And we truly were involved in enemy territory. And at that time, we were, by the time I got 30,000 men across, uh, we were outnumbered two to one in that area. But I was chagrined with General McClernand because before he crossed that river, he held a review for Governor Yates, his good friend, the governor of Illinois. I was anxious to get across that river, and he held, he delayed it, and had a full review for the governor of Illinois. I also had ordered, don't waste ammunition, and he fired a multiple uh, gun salute in honor of the governor. I said, don't bring baggage. He brought baggage, servants, and his wife across the river with him. Uh, pretty much a, a uh, distancing from me in every sense of the word clearly establishing, apparently, I had no control, no, no authority over him. But he did get across the river on April 30th. Uh, he uh, began to move. And he, we then all fought the campaign that involved May the 1st was Fort Gibson, May the 12th, the Battle of Raymond, May 14th, the Battle of Jackson, and then May the 16th, Champion Hill. And that's where I have some disagreement with him because I kept ordering him to move all three of his divisions into the Confederates. He only had one involved. In fact, he not only after three entreaties from myself, not only did he not move, he pulled back. And I, I never forgot that, that he just would not move. But we did prevail on, at Champion Hill. And then the uh, 17th, the next day we had the Battle of Big Black River, Pendleton was, uh, Pemberton was pushed across the river and into Vicksburg. Now, in that campaign, we had marched 180 miles in uh, one and fought, or fought and won five battles and had uh, 6,000, took 6,000 prisoners. So by May the 17th, we'd done all that. Now, May the 19th, we assaulted the works there at Vicksburg, and uh, uh, that was not successful. It was premature, and we didn't, we just weren't prepared for it. But I thought that they weren't prepared either. We just rolled them back into their works and that we could take them. And uh, Frank Blair led that, and, and it was not successful. The 19th went by the 20th, and I prepared to make an attack on the 22nd. Now, with that, I had an all-out assault along the entire line, and the McPherson and Sherman and McClernand all assaulted. And the, the 22nd was much like the 21st, it was a bloodbath. They tried, the, 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 the courage and the bravery of those men that day is unparalleled. The problem that I had is McClernand was telling me via messenger that he had taken two forts and occupied them. I was sitting my horse at a juncture of the lines with Sherman and I could see where McClernand was, and McClernand had not taken ground that he was claiming he had. He sent me a message, 
put a diversion out, send another message, have an assault along all the lines we can take and hold as we have taken their works. Our flags are flying over their works. And I was going to ignore them, but Sherman made the good uh, sense observation. You can't ignore that. That's an official transmission. You can't, you can't ignore that. So I sent some of uh, McPherson's men in, and it was a bloodbath, and um, most of the casualties suffered on the supporting movement that I ordered were men that were in McPherson's division, and it was to no avail. McClernand had not gotten what he claimed he'd gotten. And we pulled back, got the wounded and the dead off the field that night under cover of darkness, uh, as did the Confederates, and we were into siege. Now, after that, I had written a telegram to General Halleck and said, McClernand's dispatches, those three messages, he sent me the entreaties, give me support, give me a diversion, give me an all-out assault, misled me as to the real state of facts and caused much of this loss. And that loss that day on May 22nd, was 3,200 casualties. And that's almost as many casualties on the 22nd as we had in the entire Vicksburg campaign. And nearly half of them were troops that were sent to fulfill McClernand's request for support. 3,200 casualties, nearly half of them men to fulfill McClernand's support. And it was support that I knew should not be sent. And I would like to point out, too, that by relieving McClernand of his command of the his, his army, so declared army of the Mississippi, I made the comment that I had good reason to believe that by forestalling him, I was by no means giving offense to those whose authority to command was above him and me. I knew how Lincoln and Stanton felt. I knew how Halleck felt. And McClernand's relief or subordination in command of myself was not going to cause any problems in uh, the Army and in the, the uh, White House, and indeed it did not. Now, at the end of the battle with the after-action reports, General McClernand wrote report number seven. I shall not read the report, but there are a couple of paragraphs I think important. To say that the 13th Army Corps has done its whole duty manfully and nobly throughout this arduous and eventful campaign is only to say what historical facts abundantly establish. They opened and led the way to the field of Port Gibson and had successfully fought that battle for several hours before reinforcements came. They led the way to Champions Hill and bore the blunt or brunt of that battle. Unassisted, they fought and won the Battle of Big Black. Unassisted, they fought and won the Battle of Big Black. They made the first, if not the only, lodgment in the enemy's works at Vicksburg, retaining their advantage its longest, withdrawing last, and probably sustaining the greatest loss. Now, the complete report runs from uh, pages 137 to 157 in the official records. That's just a few part, few statements of it. And when he submitted that, I submitted this addendum and sent to General Halleck. Respectfully forwarded, this report contains so many inaccuracies that to correct it, to make it a fair report, to be handed down as a historical or as historical would require the rewriting of most of it. It is pretentious and egotistical, as is sufficiently shown by my own and all other reports accompanying. The officers and men composing the 13th Army Corps throughout the campaign, ending with the capture of Vicksburg, have done nobly, and there are no honors due the Army of the Tennessee in which they do not share equally. Uh, I thought his report was, was not good. Now, 
in all of the activities up until June the 17th. I became and was made aware on June 17th of General Orders Number 72. Headquarters, 13th Army Corps, Battlefield and Rear of Vicksburg, on uh, May 30th of 1863. And General Orders Number 72, as I said, I wasn't aware of General Orders Number 72 until June the 17th. But this was a report, an uh, order. He, called, he styled them orders. It was actually a trumpeting of their achievements uh, to the 13th Corps. And it's a three-page statement. Now, I have a couple of paragraphs for you that I should like to have you know. Opening sentence. Comrades, as your commander, I am proud to congratulate you upon your constancy, valor, and successes. History affords no more brilliant example of soldierly qualities. Your victories have followed in such rapid succession that their echoes have not yet reached the country. They will challenge its grateful and enthusiastic applause. Yourselves striking out a new path, your comrades of the Army of the Tennessee followed. And a way was thus open for them to redeem previous disappointments. He was referring to Chickasaw Bayou with that, I believe. On the 22nd of May, in pursuance of the order from the commander of that department, myself, you assaulted the enemy's defenses in front at 10 a.m. and within 30 minutes had made a lodgment and planted your colors upon two of his bastions. This partial success called into exercise the highest heroism and was only gained by a bloody and protracted struggle. Yet it was gained and was the first and largest success achieved anywhere along the whole line of our army. For nearly eight hours under a scorching sun and destructive fire, you firmly held your footing and only withdrew when the enemy had largely massed their forces and concentrated their attack upon you. How and why the general assault failed, it would be useless to explain. The 13th Army Corps, acknowledging the good intentions of all, would scorn indulgence in weak regrets and idle recriminations. According justice to all, it would only defend itself if, while the enemy was massing to crush it, assistance was asked for by a diversion at other points, or by reinforcement, it only asked what, in one case, Major General Grant had specifically and peremptorily ordered, namely, simultaneous and persistent attack all along our lines until the enemy's outer works should be carried, and what, in the other, by massing a strong force in time upon a weakened point, would probably have ensured success. Now, that was brought to my attention on June the 17th and 18th and led me to take some definitive action with General McClernand. But that must be for another reflection, for I feel I have said enough at this time. I'm so glad that you have honored me by joining me here in the war room and listening to my reflections upon my relationship with General John A. McClernand and how that unfolded as time went by. In the next uh, time that we come together and I reflect, I will be talking about my dismissal of General McClernand from his command, relieving him of his command. But for the moment, time has run out and I must needs take my leave. Thank you for being with me for this reflection and I bid you 
a fond farewell. <laughs>